Hello, and welcome to the Greater Irvine Chamber's 2021 Business Outlook. 2020 was certainly a challenging year that taught us some harsh lessons, but also reminds us that because of our high-tech business sectors and the resilient people who make up our population and workforce, we will weather this crisis better than other regions. With Irvine as the economic center of Orange County, we have good reason to be optimistic, providing insights into economic trends that will help us navigate our economic recovery we have with us today UCI's economic expert, Chris Schwarz. Although no one has a crystal ball about the continuing evolution and fallout from COVID-19, we'll hear from Chris about which sectors are poised to do better than others and what those hardest hit can expect in the near future. Before Chris begins his presentation, we have a brief message from Memorial Care, our presenting sponsor for today's program. I'm Barry Arbuckle, President and CEO of Memorial Care. We are honored to once again be the presenting sponsor for this year's Business Outlook event. The theme of today's event is recovery, which could not be more appropriate. COVID-19 has affected our lives in ways we could not have imagined. At this very moment, our dedicated caregivers at hospitals across Orange County continue to battle this pandemic nearly a year after it became a force in our community. To them, we owe our deepest gratitude and admiration. We know that tremendous opportunity can emerge from hardship. Think about how fortunate we are to now have vaccines available. And while it can't happen fast enough, we are making great progress in immunizing our community. Virtual health innovations continue to rapidly emerge so that safe care can be provided anywhere, anytime. Memorial Care alone has provided more than 200,000 virtual visits within the past year and will continue to invest in making healthcare faster, simpler, and more convenient. Lastly, I pledge Memorial Care's full commitment to the economic health of our business community. We know this pandemic has taken a toll on the financial health of many companies. Our extensive network of hospitals and more than 200 outpatient care locations, including 10 in Irvine, helps ensure the care you and your colleagues need is always close, convenient, and more affordable. We will continue to partner with you to find creative health and wellness solutions that ensure your employees get the highest possible quality of care and patient experience at a reduced cost. Thank you to the Greater Irvine Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event and to our fellow chamber members for your partnership. Today's program is sure to help us all emerge from this pandemic even stronger than we were before. May you all have a safe and successful 2021. Thank you, Memorial Care, for the great service you provide to our community. Now, it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about Chris Schwarz. Chris is an Associate Professor of Finance and Faculty Director of the Center of Investment and Wealth Management at the University of California, Irvine, Paul Mirage School of Business. Before arriving at UCI, Chris was a visiting doctoral fellow at Yale University International Center of Finance a popular speaker who has provided our region with several economic updates in recent months. Chris is a published author in many leading academic and financial journals. He's been cited in the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and New York Times, and his testimony has been presented before the U.S. Congress House Financial Services Committee. Without further ado, the stage is all yours, Chris. Well, thank you, Brian, very much for that very warm and generous introduction. It's my real pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Greater Irvine Chamber for, for having me. Of course, thank all of you for joining us here today. Uh, it's really my pleasure to represent UCI's Palmarash School of Business, as well as the Center for Investment and Wealth Management. Of course, we'd like to do this in person today. It just uh, didn't work out, but I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll be seeing you in 2022. And with all that, let's go ahead and get into the forecast. I'm looking at this 2021 here on this opening slide and wondering where, where the time went. Well, the first thing I like to do uh, is always look back and see how last year's forecast did. And uh, so many of you might want to do it the old school blockbuster VHS way and uh, be kind and rewind and just restart 2020 all over again and, and have a redo. Uh, but unfortunately for the forecast, I don't get a redo. Uh, so let's go ahead and see what I said last year at the, at the chamber. Now, please note last year at the chamber, I was mostly financial forecast, didn't have a lot on the economy. Uh, but, uh, but essentially, I said last year that uh, there's no reason to expect crashes. Oops, uh, the valuations are high and returns would be low. Well, that's kind of true. Uh, but definitely my recommendation of not getting emotional uh, and, uh, and really being into high dividend, higher quality stocks 
uh, and gold was definitely some good advice for you. Uh, and of course, if you remember, a lot of my, my talk was about how people said you didn't need to own anything about other than stocks. And, uh, and of course, that worked out well during, during March. Uh, and the last thing I really left you with was, you know, hey, what's a black swan event? Uh, this idea that the data says nothing bad's going to happen. Uh, but, you know, if you think about a chick uh, and they're bored and they're thinking about what's going to happen every day and trying to make a prediction, well, of course, the only thing that happens for a long period of time is they get fed and go pecking around the yard. But eventually, they'll end up as a chicken McNugget. Uh, and since that idea of coming, becoming a chicken McNugget's never in their data set, then they're not prepared for it, right? So the whole idea was to, to be prepared for a black swan. And of course, we definitely got a black swan in March. Uh, you know, coronavirus is uh, one of the biggest black swan type events you can think of. Uh, and again, you can see stressing not getting emotional. I told you to rebalance and get more in stocks uh, and that uh, real estate demand should be fine. So I, I think generally speaking, you know, the forecast was probably pretty helpful uh, and, uh, and last year. And so the question is, you know, can, can we keep it up this year? That's the goal here uh, with this year's, uh, this year's forecast. And really the question this year is not a matter of GDP is going to rise or not. Uh, really the question is how fast is GDP going to go up? Are we going to grow at light speed? Are we going to grow at ridiculous speed? Are we going to grow at ludicrous speed? And of course, the real ludicrous would like that. Note that spelling is different, of course. Are we going to go straight like Spaceball 1? Are we going to go to plaid? Uh, and so my guess is the economy is going to go pretty darn fast this year. Uh, but I actually think we're going to end up supply limited in the second half of the year. And I'll talk more about that uh, that coming up. All right, so let's uh, let's look at what the Fed thinks. The Fed thinks that the economy is going to grow by about 4, 4.2% uh, real GDP next year. So again, real GDP is the amount of stuff that we make. Uh, it's going to grow by 4.2%. Uh, and you'll note this is the fastest growth the Fed has predicted all the way back uh, since 2004. And if we did actually experience 4, 4.2% growth, it'd be the fastest growth that we have since the year 2000, as Conan O'Brien used to say. So really, they're looking at a forecast here that's, that's pretty darn aggressive. And so before we get into some particulars about the forecast, it's important to remember, of course, that the Fed is not a great forecaster, not terrible. Uh, but they tend to be biased too high. So if you look over the last decade or so, they've been about 0.6% too high on average. Uh, and they never forecast downturns, which again is, is self-fulfilling. The Fed's never going to say, well, there's going to be a recession next year uh, because then, of course, there's going to be a recession next year. So the Fed hasn't been a terrific forecaster. And so we've got to remember that as we go forward. A lot of people have been talking about us returning to trend, right? Returning to trend. So what do they mean by returning to trend? So this is a graph of real GDP from 1983 until uh, October of this year, so fourth quarter of this year. So I, I assumed a 4% growth rate for the fourth quarter. The data is not out yet, uh, but it'll be close enough for government work that uh, we can see what's going to happen here. And what they're saying is like, look, if COVID didn't happen, you know, probably in 2020, we would have grown at 2%. Uh, then we would have kept growing at 2%. So this dotted line here is kind of like, imagine COVID didn't happen, and this would be the growth rate of the economy. And so now once we get rid of COVID, we're just going to bounce right back to that trend line. But I don't think that's going to happen. For us to bounce back at the end of 2021 to the trend line, assuming COVID didn't happen, uh, we'd have to have 10% real GDP growth next year, which is, is just not going to happen. All right. So, uh, so we're not having 10% real GDP growth next year. So we're not going to go back to the trend line to where we were. And of course, we've never done that before. So if you look at every time we've had a recession, it's not like we've bounced back and ended up on the trend line where we were before. You can see we start a new lower trend line, right? So there's no reason that we wouldn't have the same thing happen here uh, with COVID going forward, right? So I think 10% GDP or what I'll call plaid uh, from Spaceball what is definitely out of the question here uh, for next year's uh, real GDP growth. The real question is, how fast we can go. It's going to be how much slack do we have? All right, how much McFly do we have in us? Because we really need some slack in the economy to go quickly, right? If everybody's employed and everyone's doing well, then you can't grow at 10%, right? You need some slack to make that 10% happen. And so I thought it'd be good to look back into to the end of 2009 and compare it to the end of 2020 and look to see whether or not, you know, we have a lot of slack in the economy. And so I'm not going to go through every single one of these numbers. You can peruse whatever particular one you want, but I'm going to highlight a, a couple here. So one is you see the unemployment rate is much lower in 2020 than uh, 2009. Uh, you can see capacity utilization is much higher. I think retail spending is one to really pay attention to. I mean, retail spending is higher this year than it was last year for the aggregate of the year, not just ending this particular month. Uh, you can see housing stars is more than doubled. Car sales is almost 50% higher. Uh, stock market has actually done well. Um, and so if you look here, the green, uh, the green here means that there's actually less slack in the economy than there was in 2009. 
right? So if there's this much less slack in the economy in 2020 than there was in 2009, you know, how are we going to grow at the same rate as 2010, right? So how are we going to have such great growth in 2021 if we have less slack than we had in 2009? All right, and so that's the open question that we have here going forward as we look at some of the data. So even though the amount of slack in the economy is not as, as much as 2009, there is one thing that we have a lot more than we did in 2009, and that is cash. The joker is not the only person out there with money to burn. We've had a lot of consumer stimulus over the last year, and a lot of it's gone on spent. So this is the amount of checkable deposits here in the United States. So checkable deposits are any accounts you can write a check against. And you can see that uh, there's been $2.5 trillion of new deposits added. All right, in the last year. These, so this is this is net. This is after people have spent. This is money just sitting in bank accounts, 2.5 trillion dollars, uh, which is about 12 or 13 percent of GDP just sitting there, ready to be spent. And you can see that this is unprecedented. This rise. In fact, we've pretty much doubled the amount of checkable deposits, uh, more than doubled over the course of the last year. We had some some general trend up there for a while, uh, up until 2017. That's because we upped the FDIC insurance limit. But there's just a huge amount of money out there. Uh, for people to spend. So pretty much everyone, if they want, they can feel like Bruce Wayne and they can go ahead and buy whatever hotel they want, especially because probably a lot of them uh, are bankrupt and change the rules for the pool area uh, if they so wish. All right. But you can see there's just this huge amount of money out there. Um, and so there's even more free money coming, right? Because the new stimulus is coming out in a few weeks. We'll have another $1,400 of checks for a lot of people. So that'll be another $400, $500 billion of money that's going to go into people's accounts. And the problem is, is that once things get back to normal, we're going to have a problem because there just isn't a lot of supply out there for, for these, these products that people are going to want. So if you look at 2020, uh, you can see here that uh, this is from bankruptcydata.com. Already halfway through the year, we had almost a record number of bankruptcies for companies worth more than a billion dollars. If you look at small companies through Yelp, you can see out of 160,000 businesses that are closed as of September, you can see almost 100,000 of them are now permanently closed. 100,000 small businesses that are permanently closed. I mean, that's just a huge amount of businesses and things have not gotten better since September. So this is open table data. This is the year over year change in foot traffic. Uh, you can see when that data stopped at the beginning of September, that's actually the best it's been for restaurants since the, the pandemic started. Uh, it was at minus 30% foot traffic. And now you can see in the US here, we're at minus almost 60% foot traffic again. All right, so things have certainly gotten uh, uh, worse from there. Now, some of you are thinking, I know what you're thinking, Chris, this is a new normal. Things are not going back to the way they were, right? They're never going back. And to that, I say, yeah, you have just like this guy in Die Hard. Yeah, we're not going back to, to normal. I mean, I can't even tell you how many references I could come up with here where we talk about, you know, uh, looking back in time. So, of course, here we have Amazon. If you Google change management on Amazon, I guess it's not called Google. It's, that's how good Google is at marketing, by the way. If you uh, search for change management on Amazon, you'll see there's more than 10,000 results on change management because there's one thing I've learned in life, everybody hates change. I mean, there's that, that book, Who Moved My Cheese? Uh, that everybody hates reading when their organization is getting, uh, you know, uh, reorganized. All right. Of course, you have uh, Al Bundy here on, of course, it's not Al Bundy, but Al Bundy's uh, character on uh, Modern Family. Those were the good old days. You're probably thinking about those four touchdowns he scored in some high school game uh, back in the day. And then, of course, you got uh, uh, Vince Vaughn here in Fast and the Furious. He's just thinking about those old times there as he's driving fast. And you got Andy here. He'd love, he wish he could know that you're in the good old days before you left. And then you got, you, you know, you got uh, Cher here who wishes she could turn back time. Uh, and then, of course, you got Uncle Rico here from Napoleon Dynamite, who, uh, you know, who's got this great video of him throwing the football and wishing he could go back in time and win the state championship. You know, so there's a million references to the good old days, right? When I was young or things aren't the same as good as they used to be, or I don't know what's going on with this generation or whatever you want to do, because people inherently go back to the way they were, right? Are some people change permanently? Sure. But almost everybody out there is going to go back to exactly the, the, the way they were. And, and that's really the thing is in three years, the new normal will be the old normal. And so, you know, it, flying might get a little cozy, that middle seat. You know, you might have a couple people sleeping on you again. If you go to restaurants, it might be a little challenging for you to go ahead and, and, and get some service. All right. So things might be a little bit complicated. And, and, and by the way, on flying, air, air supply is still low, too. If, you know, airlines are only 60 percent capacity right now. of their 2019 levels. All right. But the bottom line is, you know, people are going to want to buy a lot of stuff that there's not a lot of supply of. 
And so, you know, you might be going to a restaurant at the end of the year and, you know, you have a $6,400 dinner and uh, and still be hungry, all right? Or you might want to change your ticket uh, on your airline and, you know, your your change fare will be $1,137.11. And you're like, oh, whatever, I want to travel, so that's fine. And so what I'm saying is that there's probably going to be some some inflation coming up here in the second half of the year when things go back to normal. And if you could five-year inflation expectations in the market, you can clearly see here that they are on the rise. In fact, inflation expectations are the highest they've been uh, since back in, uh, in the early 2010s. So 2011, 2012, you know, we're talking about 2.2% uh, average inflation over the next five years per year. And, and I think that's uh, probably going to keep going up uh, as we go forward. All right. So again, you know, people have all this money. They're going to want to spend it when things reopen. Supply on what they probably want to spend it on is going to be low. And so I think we're certainly going to see some inflation here uh, in the second half of the year. Now, is the Fed going to do something about it? According to the Fed, they don't care pretty much. Um, and the market believes it here. And you can see here, if you look at uh, the market forecast and the Fed forecast for the federal funds rate. So this is uh, what Fed's going to keep interest rates at. You can pretty much see the market doesn't think the Fed's going to do anything pretty much on interest rates. Look at that scale. So it goes up to 0.15%. They're not going to do anything on rates for four years, almost five years. That's incredible to think about. Uh, and you can see the Fed themselves says they're basically not going to do anything uh, at the soonest until 2023, which is two years from now. Um, and they're starting keeping their asset purchases going every single. So bottom line is Fed is going to be incredibly supportive. And I think unless we get some really shocking levels of inflation, uh, that the Fed is going to go ahead and, and keep things uh, uh, keep things pretty loose. So what does this mean for the dollar? A lot of people have been concerned about the dollar. So this is a chart of the value of the U.S. dollar. So change in the value of the U.S. dollar. That's on the x-axis here. So that's the horizontal axis. Then you can see uh, T-bill minus inflation, which is your real rate of return uh, on the uh, on the y-axis there. And so I've circled basically where we are. Uh, so you know, inflation next year is going to be at least two percent. I'm guessing. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the T-bill is going to have 0%. So the real return is going to be minus 2%. You're going to lose 2% of your purchasing power to inflation. And under those circumstances, the dollar loses about 5%. So it wouldn't surprise me to see the dollar down about 5% in 2021. So you can see I'm pretty positive about the economy here. Maybe some inflation problems uh, <clears throat> coming up here during the year. Uh, but of course, like any economic forecast, there's always a few flies in the ointment, a few monkeys in the wrench that can cause things to go wrong. And so let's talk a few about a few of those here. And of course, the first one you think about, well, I mean, Chris, you haven't said anything about COVID so far. Uh, what's going on with COVID? And honestly, I really think we peaked. I, I think people are very, very pessimistic about uh, what's going to happen with COVID over the next few months. So this is case data here in the United States. This is a seven-day smooth average. Uh, at the end there, you can see some funky volatility because of the holidays. Uh, and then you can see hospitalizations, which is less funky because, of course, in, if you're in the hospital, you don't get to go home for Christmas or New Year's. But you can see that both of those have started declining from their peak. And I mean, I honestly think that we probably hit the peak number of hospitalizations. I don't want to say cases, but for sure hospitalizations here in the United States. And the reason I say that is just we're, we're ramping up the vaccine that we're, we're giving out. So as much talk as, as there's been about how we've had a slow start of the vaccine, and certainly we have, uh, you can see here that we've gone from, you know, only about 100,000 doses per day at, at mid-December, uh, and we're giving out about 1.4 million uh, uh, doses per day at this particular junction. And, and Joe Biden just says, President Joe Biden says he's, uh, he wants to up it to 1.5 million per day over the next 100 days, uh, which means that uh, by the end of, of April, we'd, we'd have 150 million doses of the vaccine outstanding. Um, you know, if you divide that by two, because it takes two doses for these first two vaccines, that would be about 75 uh, million people inoculated. And, and while that doesn't sound like very much, you don't need to inoculate as many people uh, as you think uh, to make the, you know this vaccine work. Uh, so if you look at kind of the percentage of the population uh, versus the percentage of deaths, and you rank them by age, so essentially you can see that 2% of the population is over the age of 85. You know, seven percent of the population is over the age of seven, uh, 75. You know, if you if you if you give the vaccine to 16 percent of the population, the oldest 16 percent of Americans, that represents 80 percent of the deaths that we've had in COVID. Right? If you vaccinate half the population, that's like 99 percent of the deaths. So what I'm saying here is that to get the strain off the medical system, it takes a lot less people being vaccinated than you think. 
right? If you can cut 80, 90, 99% of the deaths away, and of course the hospitalizations that go with it, then that lets you really start to open up the economy more. And so, you know, we only need to vaccinate about 54 million people to really start making a big impact on what's going on here. And you're saying to yourself, well, well, what do you mean only 54 million people? I mean, that's only 54 million first doses and then only another 75 million second doses. Uh, and of course, it's seen from uh, smoking the bandit here. Um, but really, it's not that going to take that long here. So, you know, of course, we have data through January 24th. Um, and then if I assume, you know, basically like 1.5 million doses per day, uh, by the time we get to May 1st, we'll have given out 170 million doses. Uh, 69 million people have been given both doses. And then 60, uh, 53 million people will be fully vaccinated, meaning they've been given both doses and three weeks has gone by uh, since they had the second dose, which you'll note matches the number um, that I think we, we need to really make a big impact on hospitalizations and deaths, which are the important matrix when it comes to this. So the bottom line here is I really think by late spring, things in the U.S. will start to, to get back to normal. I think we'll start being able to open up things. I mean, you can see here in California we reopened because they expect ICU data to go down. Um, and so I really think that, that we've seen peak COVID at this point. Yeah, there's some new strains, but it looks like the vaccines are generally pretty effective against them. Uh, over time. So, I mean, I, I'm very optimistic about what's going to happen with COVID. And we have reinforcements coming. You know, so this Johnson Johnson vaccine looks like it, it could get approval from the FDA in the next couple of weeks. Um, one of the really nice things about the Johnson Johnson vaccine is A, you don't need a refrigerator. So it makes distribution much easier. And logistically, you only need one shot. I can't tell you how difficult two shots is making the logistics uh, of the first two vaccines. And so I think the Johnson Johnson vaccine is going to be huge in terms of also hitting those uh, those numbers that we need to hit to get vaccinated. And my guess is, to be honest with you, in the long term, um, you know, something like the Johnson Johnson vaccine is going to just be preferred because it's just so much easier um, to deal with the transportation and, and just dealing with, with one dose. So again, I'm very optimistic about what's going to happen with COVID going forward. I, I think I'm in the minority opinion there, uh, but I truly believe we've, we're, we're kind of turning the corner right now finally on, on COVID. All right. Second fly in the ointment is the money. The government's got to run out of money at some point. Right. I mean, we spent an extra one point eight trillion dollars. So this is government outlays by month. Um, you can see earlier in the spring, we spent another you know, one point eight trillion over and above what we usually spend. Uh, it looks like we're going to have another one point nine million dollar stimulus bill coming down the pipe here in, in either January or, or February. Uh, and so at some point, you guys say to yourself, man, the government's going to run out of money. Right. Because if you look at projections, of the budget deficit. So this is uh, debt to GDP. So you, of course the deficits per year and then the, the debt is how much we've, we've accumulated in total. You know, you can see here, if you look at uh, where we are COVID, we're already up to 110%. Uh, and then you can see that, you know, it's just gonna keep and keep going up. And by 2050, the projection, this is from the, uh, from, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, now we're gonna be up to 200% of, of GDP. That's Japanese territory right there. And so at some point, you just have to imagine that we're going to have to pay the piper. So it's where they have to cut spending or raise taxes. And either one of those is going to be a negative for the economy. So uh, President Biden says he, he doesn't want to raise taxes right away while the economy is in a fragile state. Well, when things get rip roaring in the second half of the year, um, I think you'll start hearing a lot about uh, increasing taxes. And, and I'm going to say that they're going to try to increase taxes by the end of the year. Uh, and the reason I say that is because there's going to be congressional elections in 2022. You know, no one wants to vote on raising taxes, uh, you know, very close to the election. And, you know, typically the controlling party loses seats during uh, the midterm elections. And of course, if the Democrats lose any seats in the Senate, then they'll, then they'll lose the Senate. And so I think uh, I think we'll have some tax raises here in the second half of the year. So that's that's another thing uh, to look at. But of course, don't underestimate putting two dovish fair ch Fed chairs together. You know, uh, we got Yellen uh, here who is going to be our Treasury Secretary. Uh, she was, of course, a Fed chair, and she knows how the Fed works, and she was pretty dovish. And you got Jerome here, uh, Jerome Powell, who's also uh, very dovish. And so, you know, when you can have two Fed chairs together that kind of know how to work the system and can coordinate fiscal and monetary policy, I think we have to be um, expecting a, a very stimulative economy, which is one of the reasons I think uh, economic growth is going to be so fast this year. So that's, that's definitely uh, something to watch. The third and last uh, thing I want to talk about is we have a people problem here in the United States. And it's not a people problem like your neighbor is like cutting your tree down or, or toilet paper in your tree or, you know, your your office neighbor's too noisy. It's we're running out of people here. So I know that we have unemployment uh, and people that need to get jobs. But in the long term, you know, this is the working age population here in the United States. So this is 16 uh, to 65 year olds here in the U.S. 
and you can see the number is actually going down. So we have lost 1.7 million workers from the peak of our working age population. Uh, in fact, we've been losing about 40,000 people per month uh, this year. So again, this is not about participation. This is about physical people uh, that exists in our population. And so, you know, we're losing that population. And, and the question becomes, you know, how fast can we grow in the long term if we don't have a lot of people? Uh, and so that's something that we're definitely going to have to spend a lot of time thinking about uh, as we go forward. How do we work policies when we don't have a lot of people? All right. So economically, I think this is going to be a, a good year. It's going to be a, above the new trend. So new trends probably like 1.5 percent, but we're going to be well above that. And it's just a question of how fast we grow. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, some people are thinking 4 percent. I think some people are thinking, thinking 6 percent. Uh, I've heard a few people say 10 percent. I don't think we're going to get to 10 percent. I think somewhere between uh, probably 3 to 6 percent is the correct number, just depending on, on how things go. Uh, but either way, it's going to be a quickly uh, a quick growing year. Um, you know, I think that it's really going to be economically two different years. So I think we're going to be in a very monetary, fiscal, supportive state for the first half of the year. And the second half of the year, man, I think we're, we're just going to have a lot of people buying a lot of stuff, traveling, restaurants, movies, shopping. Uh, and I think there's going to be some concerns that pop about, up about inflation in the second half of the year. And it wouldn't be surprising to see some of that support uh, being pulled away either by the Fed not buying assets, uh, by the Treasury trying to raise taxes. Uh, and so I think that it's going to kind of be like two separate years almost uh, as we go along. Uh, and then, you know, unless the vaccine doesn't work, it's really difficult for me to think of a way that we don't grow, you know, that we don't grow uh, this year. I mean, we basically shut down the economy in the second quarter last year. Uh, and so as long as we don't shut down the economy for a quarter this year, I mean, it's difficult for me even to come up with a black swan event. Uh, that would work. I mean, the Fed's supportive. There's no elections coming up. I mean, I doubt Biden's going to start a war or do something crazy. And so we'll, we'll have to see what happens uh, in the second half of the year. All right. So real quickly, I just want to talk about housing. I mean, housing is so hot right now. It's like Hansel from uh, Zoolander. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy, right? So, I mean, there's really not much to say about housing. I mean, Everything points to a hot 2021. I mean, low rates are the lowest ever. I mean, even with the 10-year going up a little bit, mortgage rates are still very, very low. Uh, so that makes housing cheap. Uh, if you look at housing, I mean, it might be easier to find a PlayStation 5 to buy than a house right now. I mean, inventory is pretty much the lowest that we've ever seen before. So rates are the lowest we've ever seen. Inventory is the lowest we've ever seen. Uh, and then, of course, what that means is that prices are on the move. So this is actually a, a month-old case shiller just came out uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, and uh, and so you can see prices have gone up right now. Uh, you know, we're, we're close to 10 percent year over year. I think the new number was 9.5 percent year over year. And quite frankly, I, I think it's going to keep going. Uh, so I think housing is, is incredibly uh, is going to have an incredibly good year. Uh, just there's just so little supply and so much demand and rates are so low. You know, until we get some more supply in the market, pretty much we are stuck. Uh, in a very a competitive uh, housing situation. So it's definitely a, a seller's market out there uh, in 2021. Well, that just leaves us with one more thing to talk about, and that's financial markets. And you know, pretty much my current thoughts on financial markets can be summed up like this. Uh, they're kind of crazy, uh, a little bit crazy. Uh, so we're all stocked up, uh, no pun intended, on craziness in financial markets. Uh, so please, please don't bring any more crazy. Uh, to the market. So just let me give you an exhibit here. This is GameStop. I'm sure you guys have probably read some stuff about games, uh, GameSpot. So at one point on uh, on Monday this week, GameSpot uh, was up 4,000%. I get, okay, let me be precise. 3,600% in one year uh, for pretty much no reason. Uh, you know, the stock has been uh, spiking up and down. And and, uh, and so things have, have just pretty much uh, pretty much gone crazy for GameSpot. And, and no, I didn't pull a Mike Bolton from Office Space and, and screw up some kind of decimal place. It, it really is up 3,600% uh, over the course of the last year. And you might think, hey, this uh, this is pretty amazing. In fact, it, it, it's so amazing. It, it makes Tesla and Bitcoin over the last year look like bad investments. And that takes some real talent. Uh, you know, Tesla's only up like seven or eight hundred percent over the last year, and Bitcoin's up uh, three or four hundred percent. And uh, and Game Gamespot makes them all seem uh, like uh, just tiny, tiny little games here. And of course, gains here. Now, of course, you you think to yourself like Gamespot must be an amazing company. Then I mean, it must be really turning itself around. Um, and you can see that uh, if you look at sales, a blue line across the top there. Sales are declining over the last uh, two or three years. And you can see in pretty much all the third years that the company's lost money. And, and this year, you know, sales are up a little bit during the pandemic, but it's still losing money. And so it's uh, it's pretty pretty incredible to watch this uh, this little company uh, uh, go so crazy. And there's lots of reasons for it. Uh, but just one example, crazy. A second example of crazy is Signal. 
Uh, so, uh, so Signal, uh, you know, is a company that uh, they do uh, messaging, um, and so there's some some concern about WhatsApp. There's a a post about WhatsApp sharing data with Facebook, and so Elon Musk here has told everybody to use Signal, uh, which is a which is a messaging app. And of course, this is Signal, the uh, the stock here. And you can see, uh, you know, he tweeted about it in the seventh, and you can see by the eighth, the stock was up over 800% in just uh, 24 hours. And of course, now you can see it's back down to earth. That's exactly where it was when it when it started. Um, and the reason for that is because you had a few people that uh, need David's T-shirt here from uh, Schitt's Creek. Uh, you know, they're uh, uh, they just didn't quite pay attention because you can you can see they traded SIGL, which is Signal Advance, which is an engineering research and technology development business. Uh, they do a signal detection delays associated with physical sensors. And I won't read the rest. Basically, they do nothing with the messaging app. Uh, and so they were trading the wrong signal. So there's a lot of crazy out there in the marketplace. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, that has me a little bit concerned um, because of just the amount of naive re retail money out there uh, and how it's affecting, especially small cap stock prices. Um, so the issue with the markets is they're either really cheap or really expensive, depending on what your measure is. Um, and it's really hard to imagine, you know, that markets are going to have a bad year. I mean, you maybe you could argue they're not going to have a great year because, you know, we might be in that space where everything that's, you know, bad news really is bad news, and anything that's good news really is is bad news. Um, uh, but with with GDP growth going to be four to six percent, and all the money floating around and rates so low, you know, it's very difficult to imagine that we're going to have a bad year uh, when it comes to stocks. I'm not sure we're going to have a great year or not, but it's hard to imagine a bad year. All right, so let's look at some price measures. So this is the Schiller price to earnings ratio. So again, this is a, a way to look and see how expensive stocks are. This is one, one measure of price to earnings ratio. Uh, and you can see there's just one mountain left to climb here. So we've eclipsed uh, 1920s uh, here. And, and now we only have the internet bubble left to go here. So we're, we're, we're getting closer to the, the last mountain to climb. So the bottom line here, stocks are expensive. Um, if you look at forward PE, uh, so this is uh, next year's earnings divided by the, uh, you know, next year's earnings as the denominator. So price divided by next year's earnings. Um, you can see we, again, we just have one mountain left to climb, uh, which is 1999, the peak of the internet bubble. Uh, so here prices, uh, you know, stocks look pretty expensive here. Um, but then if you look by yields, right? So this is a comparison of the interest rate you could get by uh, investing in long-term treasury bonds. Uh, this is the dividends you can get on the S&P 500. Um, and you can see that this is, again, still one of those rare moments where um, bonds are, uh, are yielding less than the dividends on the S&P 500. So from this measure, relatively speaking, stocks are much cheaper um, than you have for bonds, right? So this would say it's a great time uh, to buy stocks. And so like I said, you know, if you look at the traditional PE, the, those measures, it looks like stocks are very expensive. If you look by yields, it looks like prices are, are, are generally very cheap. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of the, the conundrum here. Are stocks cheap or are they expensive? And I think it very much depends on your view rate of glasses. It really doesn't matter if you think they're cheap or expensive or if they're in a bubble or not. Uh, the bottom line is we're going to have incredibly low returns going forward. Um, so this is a chart here that looks at uh, the x-axis here is where we are in the Schiller price to earnings ratio. Um, the y-axis is your average future 10-year return on the S&P 500. Uh, and you can see that this is a very much a declining uh, return. So the high, more expensive you pay for stocks, the lower return you get, which of course is very rational. Um, and you can see you're basically where that black dot is right there, which uh, is going to give you a 4% return going forward. So we're going to have some pretty low stock returns going forward. So that's what I mean by I, I don't know if we're going to have a great year. Um, if we have a great year and we end up at you know PEs of 40, 45, I'm going to be pretty concerned to be honest with you. Um, I don't think we're going to have a bad year, but I think it's going to be difficult to, you know, have one of those 20, 30, 40 percent gains year unless we really have a, a blow off top like we did in, in the late 90s. All right. Some areas have definitely done better than others. So this is a ratio of the NASDAQ stocks to the NYSE stocks. So you can think like the, the Apples, Teslas, Amazons of the world versus, you know, the 3Ms and the P&Gs and all that kind of stuff. And you can see that the NASDAQ has done way better than the NYSE. And so the question becomes, well, is this permanent or are we going to have a shift back like we did uh, in the tech bubble, right? Uh, small caps have done worse than large caps too. And, and so, you know, growth's done better than value. So you have these places that are done better than others. And maybe that's a place where you, know, you want to invest some money because you can get, you know, a little bit uh, better return there. All right. So one of the fundamental questions is, you know, stocks. I mean, I think it's okay to own stocks. I don't, I don't think they're going to crash this year. Again, they might not do well. Um, you know, one of the open questions is, is it really worth owning long-term bonds at this point. So right now, if you buy bonds, the 10-year Treasury yield is 1.1%, right? So that means that you know each year, if the price stays the same for the next 10 years, you're going to earn a return of 1.1%, which you know doesn't really sound all that great. 
you know, so if you think about a 60 40 portfolio, 40% in bonds, you know, 40% of 1.1 is only 0.44%. So basically, the net aggregate impact on your portfolio is only about 0.4% per year, which is not very much. But there's a lot of downside risk here, right? So if the yield moves to 1.23%, the price of the bond goes down, and you lose so much on the value of the bond that you basically lost all your interest for the year. If yields simply go back to 1.75%, you lose all of your interest for the next five years. All right, and so we we've, we've been in this environment for a very long period of time now, where where bond yields have gone down, and the question happens: what, what happens if yields go up? Right? I mean, just what happens if we have this this universe where instead of rates going down all the time, what happens if rates start going up for a long period of time? And so I thought it would just be interesting to look at kind of how things do in, in rising rates versus declining rates environment. So you can see here I have in blue from 1965 to 1981. So um, during that time period, rates went from 4% on the 10-year to 16%. Um, and then I have from 1982 to, to last year, so rates went from 16% to 1%. So they're almost mirror images of each other. And these are real returns. So this is looking after you control for inflation because inflation was very different between the two periods. Um, and you can see that you know financial financial assets do great when rates decline. You can see real estate does better. I mean stocks did you know way better. Bonds did way better. Um, and that's because of course declining rates make asset prices go up. Uh, and what happens when when rates go up? Well, you can see that of course uh, asset financial assets didn't do well, but real assets did well. Things that uh, basically go up with inflation. So gold and oil did. Uh, well, and so, you know, the question is, if we start seeing rates go up, it seems like we should be favoring things like gold and oil over things like uh, stocks and bonds. And so I think, you know, if you if you think that rates are going to go up here, that we are going to have inflation going forward, and to be honest, I think we're going to have that. You know, maybe it's worthwhile to look at, at, at things like adding some gold and commodities to your portfolio, which honestly, I'd never tell you to do. I don't have international stocks on here because I have old data, but I also think international stocks are probably a, a good place to be. Um, at least some of your portfolio uh, going forward now, uh, if, if the Fed's really going to keep rates low for four or five years, um, like they're like they're telling everyone. All right. So, like I said, I think it's going to be a particularly good year for gold. Uh, so usually, again, uh, gold does well uh, when uh, when real when real rates of return on the T bill are low, which is going to happen this year. So I think you could be looking up to a 10, 20% return on gold uh, in this year. Uh, and so again, I think gold is a good hedge uh, as, uh, as a second year hits and everybody starts going buying stuff that they claim they're never going to buy again. All right, so in conclusion, you know, I think this is going to be a really good year for the economy. I think it's going to be uh, at least not a bad year for financial assets. I think um, you know, this could be a bit of a mirror image of 2020. You know, last year, you know, the economy did too particularly well, but financial assets did amazing. I think this could be a year where the economy does uh, particularly well, but financial assets don't do that great. Um, you know, no matter what, if you're looking at the market, stay away from crazy. Have a plan. Don't gamble. Don't be buying GameSpot. You're just you're playing the greater fool theory. You don't want to do that. And really, you know, the two things that are key here that you really should keep your eye on is inflation. You know, if inflation um, starts really rising rapidly, that's going to be the buzz killer for the party, right? As long as inflation is not very high, the Fed is going to have loose monetary policy, which is going to help the economy, which is going to help financial assets. Uh, and so, you know, watch inflation. As long as inflation stays tame, the Fed's on our side and things are going to go uh, going to go well for the economy and, and uh, financial markets. And if inflation starts ticking up, that's kind of your your warning flag um, that the Fed's going to have to start thinking about raising rates. I hope you enjoyed this year's forecast and found it informative. Really looking forward to seeing you in 2022. Of course, if anything too exciting happens between now and then, we'll have an update for you. Take care and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Chris. You've given us a lot to consider as we make our way through this crisis and work towards the best possible economic recovery. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, Memorial Care. And to all of our event sponsors that have made today's program possible and for their commitment to our community. And finally, thank you to all of our viewers for participating in the Greater Irvine Chamber's 2021 Business Outlook and for your continuing contributions that help to keep our community vibrant and economically sound.